Just out of college, my first job was actually a teaching job. I was 21 years old. Some of my students were only three or four years younger than I was. And I remember the summer before beginning that teaching job, I started to have first day of school dreams. Any teachers have first day of school dreams? I realized that was not just the first summer, that was going to be every summer for the rest of my life. I was going to have first day of school dreams. You know, you show up in your pajamas, you haven't prepared anything. My big one was I couldn't find my classroom. And so all I kept thinking was, all these kids are unsupervised, they're staying in the classroom, I have to find them. So I thought that summer that I would kind of prepare for my first year teaching. And I prepared by watching those sort of inspirational teaching movies, you know, the O Captain, My Captain, all the kids standing on the desk. And the ones that were most inspirational to me were the ones where the teachers were in kind of the tough, out of luck schools, and they really brought kids into a great place. Like you know, Edward James almost and Stan at the liver. He brings kids that knew hardly any math and they take the AP calculus test, you know, and get almost perfect scores. And then there was another movie called Dangerous Minds, where Michelle Pfeiffer was a former Marine, and she was an English teacher, and she comes to the classroom and she inspires these kids through poetry. She shows them the poem by Dylan Thomas, Do not go gently into that good night, rage, rage against the dying of the light. Well, I'm not much of a math person, and I did enjoy poetry, so I thought, well, maybe I'm going to be kind of more of a Michelle Pfeiffer type. I think I'll, I'll be more of a Michelle Pfeiffer, I'm not a former Marine, I'm not that tough, but I thought, you know, maybe this is kind of, this is, this is more my speed, instead of trying to get kids to take an AP calculus exam. So I think of that as I think of our passage this morning when Jesus is giving another one of the I Am statements. Because Jesus was a teacher from the time that he was very, very young. You know, Jews throughout the year have several festivals and feasts that they celebrate. And Jews who are near or far to Jerusalem, they will come into Jerusalem to celebrate these feasts. And so like a good Jewish family, Jesus at 12 years old, they came to Jerusalem. Jesus is teaching in the temple courts. And his parents don't know where he is because they can't imagine as a 12-year-old teaching. So they leave and then realize he's not there. And we have kind of this space between that 12 years old and then 30 when he's baptized and begins his ministry. But throughout his ministry, Jesus is a teacher. When Mary first sees him, Mary is one of the women who comes to the tomb. And when she first sees him resurrected, she says, Rabboni, teacher. This is how she recognized him, was with that name. Now Jesus is a little bit more spiritual than I am. Uh, so Jesus prepares a little bit more spiritually for teaching. And many times throughout the year in these festivals, Jesus would come to the temple. He was from Galilee, so he would walk down to Jerusalem with his disciples. And they would visit the temple, and Jesus would teach. So during one particular feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus prepared to come and to teach. And he prepared by staying up all night praying on the Mount of Olives. And this is how Jesus prepared quite a bit. He prepared this way before choosing his disciples. He was preparing, he was in prayer on the Mount of Olives when he was arrested and ultimately taken to trial and crucified. So Jesus prepared all that night. And we can just imagine as the morning light began to dawn over Jerusalem, and if you've seen the sunrise over the hills of Jerusalem, it's a beautiful thing. As the sunrise starts to come over the mountains and starts to fall on the temple, Jesus is walking across the Kidron Valley going through the gates of Jerusalem, heading into the temple. And then in the midst of this feast, Jesus is going to stand up. And he's going to make a significant claim about who he was. He stands up and he says in the Gospel of John, when Jesus spoke again to the people, as he had done before, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of of life. Please pray with me. Our great God, we are so thankful for your presence here. We welcome your presence, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I ask, Holy Spirit, for your refining fire to move through each one of us, that you may speak to us the words you have for us today. We pray all these things in the name of that great light, Jesus Christ. Amen. So imagine this scene. You know, Jesus comes to the temple in the morning as the morning is breaking, the dawn is breaking. But I've got to imagine that he stands up and actually says this statement, kind of as the dusk is coming and the night is coming. And the reason why I'm picturing this way, so we don't see that in scripture necessarily saying that was the timing, but why I'm picturing it this way is because this particular feast 
was a feast celebrating fire or light. So the Feast of Tabernacles is what he has come to Jerusalem to celebrate, and this feast is a remembrance of the pillar of fire, God appearing as a pillar of fire in the wilderness, leading the people through the wilderness at night. And it was called the Feast of Tabernacles because as they were wandering in the wilderness, they kind of had to pack up and move every once in a while as they were going, and as they would move, they would pack up everything and move it. And they didn't have a stationary temple like what Jesus is teaching at in this passage. But they had a tabernacle where they would worship God that God told Moses how to create. And so they would pick up the tabernacle and they would take it with them. So this feast is a celebration of God appearing in this pillar of fire. So in the temple, you have the lampstands called menorahs. And there's all different kinds of menorahs. So for Hanukkah, you have a nine-candle menorah. But in the temple, there are seven-candle menorahs. And you can only light these types of menorahs in the temple. And so I'm picturing Jesus standing up. These menorahs were huge, you know, much bigger than our, our candles here. So these menorahs were huge, and I'm picturing Jesus standing up, and the fire is burning on the top of these candles, and it's burning light into the darkness all around. And then he says this amazing statement, I am the light of the world. Whoever walks with me will never walk in darkness. And I think John is thinking of this scene, because John, in his gospel, as he writes this, all throughout John's gospel, from the very beginning chapters, to the epistles that he's going to write to the churches as he's an elder later on, to the vision that he has of heaven in the book of Revelation, he's constantly talking about light and darkness. So I wonder if this scene had kind of an impact on John, to where every time he thinks about Jesus, he thinks about Jesus standing up and saying, I am the light. Because John spends a lot of time in his gospel and in the letters talking about light and darkness. And in heaven, his vision of heaven, he makes a specific point of saying that in heaven, there is no night, there is no darkness, only light. So maybe he's looking back on this scene and remembering, and this stays with him as he goes through his ministry and his career remembering and looking back on Jesus. But that day had also been a difficult day. That day had had some very difficult scenes. And in the morning of that day, as Jesus came down the valley and came through the valley to the gate and comes into the temple, he started to preach in the temple of the court of women, the court of women. And during that time in the morning, he had his first attempted stoning of the Feast of Tabernacles. And I said the first one, because there's going to be another one that's going to come up a little bit later. And his first attempted stoning, as he's teaching in the court of women, and several of the leaders bring in a woman who's been caught in adultery. And for John, I think he includes this story because it's a picture of darkness that we can see. Sometimes sin is very evident. We can see it. We look around our world and we see the darkness of sin. It's clear. It's right in front of us. And so everyone around him is kind of trying to trap Jesus. They're picking up their stones and they're saying, Rabbi, teacher, this woman is supposed to be stoned according to the law. And Jesus, he kind of, he doesn't turn it around, but he turns it inward. Because what Jesus is concerned about is not the physical manifestation of sin, which he's concerned about. He tells her, go forth and sin no more. But he's concerned about what's happening in our hearts and the darkness that's in our hearts. And so he said to each one of them, take a look at yourselves. And the first one who is without the darkness of sin, pick up a stone and throw it. And one by one, they dropped it and walked away. But Jesus is the only one left. Because he's the only one who doesn't have the physical, the physical effects of sin. Because he doesn't even have the inward effects of sin. He doesn't have any darkness in him. There's nothing in him that is dark. But then later on in that teaching, in that festival, when Jesus is teaching, there's another attempt at stoning. And it's of Jesus himself. Because Jesus is going to make a serious claim. Now he's already kind of moving in this direction. He's saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever walks in me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Well, light is associated with God and who God was. So he was already kind of starting to move into some dangerous territory for a lot of the people who were listening. And then finally, at the end of this feast that Jesus is teaching, he told all of them, your descendant Abraham, your father Abraham, he longed for this day to come 
He looked to this day when the Messiah would come, thousands of years before, he looked to this day. And they're all looking around confused, saying, how did this guy talk to Abraham? He's not even 50 years old. And he looked at them all and he said, before Abraham was, I am. So he's not only making a connection back to that name that God had given Moses, but he's saying this at the Feast of Tabernacles, where he's standing in front of this seven-candled candelabra that stands for the words of creation. And the very first words of creation out of God's mouth were, let there be light. So from the very first moment that Jesus has decided to preach at this festival, he is making significant claims of who he is. And for every one of us, we are just like that people in the crowd. That we have a choice about what our response is going to be. Because it's the response to the great I am. He is making that claim of who he is. And in the I am, there is no darkness. There is no darkness at all. Just light. In 1939, a few days before war was declared between Britain and Germany in World War II, Britain began the blackout of Britain. And actually one of our congregation members, June, one of our pastor's aides, actually survived the battle of Britain. And she talks about every night having to black out all the windows. Because this was the first time in World War I they had had some aerial warfare from the, from, the, from the air, but in World War II most of the warfare was from the air. And so even a little bit of light, like if you can imagine when you fly over something at night, and even just one house, you can see it, how clearly you can see it. And so they wanted to hide away the light because the Germans, when they would fly over, as soon as they found this one speck of light, they would know where to drop a bomb. So a lot of times, you and I, we kind of feel safer in the dark. We feel safer living in the dark. Because we think of the great I am as an enemy. He's waiting. He's going to find our weakness, he's going to find it, and he's going to drop the ball. That's kind of the way we picture it. But Jesus, by standing up and saying, I am the light of the world, before Abraham was, I am, what he is giving us is an opportunity to make a decision between the great I am being in charge of us, or I am in charge of me. And this is the decision that's always before us. The great I am led the people with a pillar of fire through the wilderness. Are we going to let the great I am lead us? Or am I going to make my own way? It feels a lot easier to make our own way. But a lot of times that way leads us into even more darkness and confusion. Are we going to let the great I am bring his light into the areas where we need his forgiveness? You know, light is such a healing thing. If you've ever had a little guy with jaundice, you know, they put you out in the sunlight or they have to put him under a lamp for several hours because the light, it brings that healing from what's going on inside. So that light brings forgiveness. Instead of trying to just make our own light, our own ways of coping to try to keep the darkness down, try to keep it just padded down just enough that we can kind of get through another day. But the great I am doesn't want us to live that way. He wants to shine his light and bring true and deep light. And do we choose to walk in the light of the great I am in relationship with him? Or do we choose to remain safe or feel safer in the darkness? Because we're afraid of the great I am and what may happen when he spots who we are. But the reality is, he already shines his light in. He already knows. And he stands up and he calls us to himself. I am the light of the world. The great I am. Before Abraham was, I am. So those people there had a choice. And when Jesus said that, they picked up stones to throw, throw at him. That was their choice. This is blasphemy. And so Jesus, one of many times, there's been a few times people have tried to stone Jesus. This is one of the few times that Jesus is, is attempted to be stoned. And what he does, and we, don't, we can't describe it any other way, except that he just kind of went invisible. 
Because they said that it walked through the crowd and nobody saw it. And this is going to happen two or three times. So Jesus said, okay guys, you may be trying to sell me right now, but it's not my time yet. So I'm just going to walk through the crowd, and he just walks on his way. So this passage began with a stoning, and it's going to end with an attempted stoning. And both are illuminating for us that there is darkness in this world, but the great I am is the one who guides us, the one who forgives us, the one who wants to walk in relationship with us so that we walk in his light. When I was preparing to teach, I wasn't preparing to teach at a tough inner city school. The school that I graduated from was a sweet Christian high school. I had 42 in my graduating class. Um, so I was going back to teach with teachers that I had had as my own teachers. To this day, I can't call them by their first name. You know, almost seven, many, many, many years later. And so I thought to myself, well, I'm probably never going to really have one of those kind of inspirational moments. You know, there's, not a, there's not a lot of really tough stuff that happens at Redwood Christian High School. My sister was about six, she's about six years younger than I am, and she was in the class of 2003. So it actually ended up that there was a couple years that Allison was a student of mine, and I was her class advisor. And so at first, Allison kind of bucked up against this a little bit. I think she didn't quite appreciate always having kind of a sister around. Um, but then she realized that I always had cash on me. And so whenever we were on field trips or on the senior trip, she'd always kind of find me and be like, so Kelly, can we so, give me $10? And I thought, okay, all right. So we made our peace with each other that I provided, and I was just there, and I'd leave her alone, let her do her thing. She was a class of 2003. And that class in the very last months before graduation, just faced incredible tragedy. In spring break, in the middle of April, a young man by the name of Paul, who was one of my teacher's aides, had worked with me for many years, class president, just a really sweet, sweet kid. And he died suddenly in a hiking accident over spring break. And it was just, it just rocked the entire class. And about a week before graduation, we were having final exams on campus, and all of a sudden, I hear this siren start to go off, and I see people running around the campus, and I, I kind of finally pulled somebody aside and said, what has happened? They said, Mr. Schaff has collapsed. He's not responsive. Their high school constitution teacher had had a massive heart attack right there on campus in front of a whole classroom of kids. One of the young men was trying desperately to revive him with CPR until the authorities came, until the emergency vehicles came. And he never revived, he never regained consciousness. I remember thinking to myself, God, this, this is too much. What do you say? What in the world do you say to this group of kids who is looking at their senior year and this will forever be kind of tainted through this? So the day after Mr. Schaff passed away, I had my announcement sheets in my morning class. And I thought, okay, this is, this is my chance. Yeah, this is my moment. Yeah, maybe I can pull out a Dylan Thomas poem. I don't know what I don't know what to do in this moment, but this is my moment. And I just started to cry. And I was so choked up with tears I couldn't speak. So one of my students very sweetly came up and he took the paper and he read the paper for me. And a few days later at graduation, the valedictorian stood up and she said everything that everybody had wanted to say but couldn't say. And she said, she looked out at the audience, and she said, today, this very night, the night of our graduation, we have an empty seat among our friends. And she pointed up to her group, and Paul's empty seat. She said, if we have an empty seat among our faculty, and they had left a seat for Mr. Schaff. She said, at such a young age, our class now understands that we are no longer innocent of the darkness of this world. She said, but Jesus is the light. And Jesus will always be the light. And I will always think of that moment in some of the first verses of John. The light has shone in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Friends, this is the truth of walking in the light of Jesus Christ. That when we walk in his direction, we don't go our own way. We let him shine his light into those places that need to be forgiven and cleaned out. 
when we walk in his light and in his relationship and relationship with him, we no longer walk in darkness. So let us walk in the light. Don't turn away and never look back. Please pray with me.